Is your coach open back into the gap? Oh, right, that's a coach. It's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Leads the country in offensive rebound. Hey, coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver, the founder, CEO, and creative mind behind basketballimmersion.com. This is the podcast where you will hear real basketball coaching conversations. Whether you are a new or experienced coach at any level of basketball, these coaching conversations will give you practical ideas to stimulate your coaching and make what you do even better. Without any more delay, let's share the game. Okay, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm excited to have a coaching conversation with Nate Oates. Nate is at the University of Buffalo, and prior to that was a highly successful high school coach. And Coach, welcome to the podcast. And what amazes me is that you were so close to me across the border, and we didn't even know each other back then when you were doing a great job at the high school, at Romulus High School. Yeah, I, I'm probably my loss, to be honest with you. I met you down there at the Florida Clinic, and I can't believe he's <laughs> – He's, I would have been over there a few times. We always we always went out to see different training camps and practices and with all the stuff you're doing. I definitely would have been over there. So, I, shoot, I think while you were speaking, I was texting my assistants, former assistants that are head coaches, all the basketball junkies back in Detroit, like, you guys got to get over to Windsor. And I said, look, send them your, the link to your website. And but I think that they've been on it because some of them sent me some stuff from your website. So it's been good. Uh, it's been great. It's been great to connect with so many people like you and Coach, incredible success at the high school level as an assistant coach. And now as a head coach, I mean, school record for wins, won an NCAA tournament game in the NCAA tournament the last incredible success at the high school level as an assistant coach. And now as a head coach, I mean, school record for wins, won an NCAA tournament game in the NCAA tournament the last three of the four years. I think what your story really paints a picture for coaches is, is just be ready for the opportunity. You don't know when it's going to come. No, it's very true. I mean, as a high school coach, you never knew. I had a goal, a dream, maybe that I get into Division One, but it had to be the right situation. I had put a lot of time and program at Romulus. I didn't want to leave for anything. So then when Bobby Hurley calls and offers you something, that's obviously something you got to look at with the name of their family. I mean, that's kind of basketball royalty there with Bob Sr. and Danny and Bobby. So, you know, I felt like I was ready. I'd been running my high school program as close to a college program as I could in high school. And part of the reason Bob hired me was that uh, I'd been a head coach for 11 years and he didn't have any head coaching experience. So I walked in and he was definitely the head coach, but I, I was ready to be an assistant in college and then shoot at Arizona State. And I think if we've proved he, he made the right decision there. So yeah, five years ago, I was teaching high school still at this time. It's amazing. And I think it gives hope to many people that are working towards their goals whatever those goals are that really, I mean, you can't predict it. You don't know when it's going to come. And all you can do is do the best where you are and prepare for it. And you've clearly shown that and you've done a tremendous job at Buffalo. I mean, I've said it to you before, but you're one of the NCAA teams that I really enjoy watching. And we're going to get into why, but it's, you're very enjoyable. You do a great job with the style of play in addition to, you know, how disciplined your players play. I appreciate that, Chris, coming from you especially. But yeah, I mean, it was fun. And you know what, to be honest with you, we change a ton what I was doing in high school I mean I, you got more time to tinker with stuff and sit down and play around with it here but it, general premises aren't, aren't that much different to be honest with you let's talk about high school a little bit since you brought that up and I think that's a great connection for AAU or high school coaches that you said you ran your high school program as close to a division one program we actually for AAU or high school coaches that you said you ran your high school program as close to a division one program as possible what are some of the things, I mean, you don't have the resources exactly the same, but what are the, some of the things that transfer to both levels that you gave a lot of attention to? You know, I think we actually could do more in high school on some regards because I didn't have the rules with the hours you could spend. So we, I mean, in high school, we were working out at 6 a.m. and working out again after school. And some of my guys sometimes wanted an evening workout in. I told people, like, how much harder is it in college? Well, shoot, like... When I'm here, you know, I mean, you got to be on the road more recruiting. But when I'm here, I, I get home sooner. And, like, I can go see my daughter's games in the evening and stuff. Like, it's just, you're limited. The NCAA doesn't allow you so many hours. So, in high school, the player development was a big piece. I think that we've done as much as we can in college, the way the rules are, to continue to develop players. And I thought the video piece was from some other high school programs, like a lot of them, and even some former assistants that have gone on to work for other guys. and. 
different stuff. Like well, we videotaped every practice, at least up until our first game. And then even after that, we still did some, you know, we had plenty of managers and videotape the practice, break it down, come back and show them the next day. Like that, to me, that was stuff that maybe a lot of high schools aren't doing and colleges were doing and our, just our video prep on scouts for different high school teams. I had a video guy that would go out and record games and we'd break down games. We weren't using the high end. We were using an iMovie, but it still got, the, the finished product wasn't that much different than what we got now. It's just a little bit longer to get there, but I think the video aspect was part of it. It helped with uh, selling players. I, I think, Number one thing we said coming in is we're going to, you know, make sure our players were number one in high school. We do the same thing in college. In high school, that means a little bit different. We were trying to get our guys into college. So the video aspect, having highlights available at any time for college that wanted to see what particular kids could do, what uh, kids could do, whether it was Division One, Two, Junior College, Division Three, and AI, whatever it is, you know, I thought we did a pretty good job getting our high school kids into college and building those relationships with colleges. So that's some of the stuff we did in high school that, somewhere to college maybe yeah that's neat to hear and it's amazing to hear that you had more time in high school to work with your players and I've always found that an interesting part in talking to NCAA coaches and you know the restrictions you have in terms of your access to players actually on the court but so much of your development I assume happens off the court as well in terms of access to a player building the relationship and video and different things that way so I would assume those things transfer from high school to college as well yeah, and you know what, in college, is obviously you've got a lot more access to, you know, with Synergy and different programs, and we use this Just Play, or you're right, you can do an NBA edit of a guy that you think they could really apply some stuff and send it to them, you know, where you're not necessarily sitting down watching with them, but they can come back and ask you questions, but you send them with them, but they can come back and ask you questions, but you send them. So we just got more people here to do more stuff and do those breakdowns and different things like that. We're in high school, it was... Everybody's part-time, made $4,500 as a high school coach. So the assistants were pretty much volunteers. So, you know, there's no full-time, you know, now you got a lot more full-time guys and you can do a lot more video breakdown stuff for our players. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And so happy for you and uh, obviously the success. And let's get into it then. I mean, offense. I mean, that's the fun. And first in field goals made per game, fourth in scoring. And then fifth in length of possession on offense, is that what – did I get that right? Yeah, that's what Ken Palm had us for. So, I think overall, you know, when they do overall tempo, I think they include some defense and different stuff. We were, I think, 16th in tempo. But length of possession, just straight length of possession, we were fifth. So, we play pretty fast. Probably contributes to first in the country and field goals made. I think Villanova was two. So, we were second in the country in number of 80-point games. I think it was number one. So, not bad company on the offensive end. Great company. Great company for sure. No, that's great. So what are some of the things that you feel have led to some success on offense for you guys that we can share with coaches? You know what I think? So player development is number one in our program. We kind of call it a player's program and we're going to spend a ton of time. I mean, in the summer, we're going to get them in. We're going to work on their games. So I think number one is we don't want our guys being robots. Like I want guys making plays. I want the ball hit ahead in transition. I tell our guys, I don't want to have to call sets unless there's a whistle blown, like whether it's a make or a miss, we're trying to push the ball up the floor. And and I want the space, you know, you got to coach them still. It's not like you're not coaching them, but the the spacing's got to be right. And if you've got a one-on-one opportunity with a guy in front of you, like you better be able to beat them. And to me, the best way to do that is in transition before the defense gets set. So we hit the ball ahead. We, you know, our wings make plays the ball. If we don't have a hit ahead available, we run a so our, our offensive trans and we don't run a secondary. I did in high school a few times. I felt like hey, most of the secondary breaks, you know, point guard brings up, reverses it through to trail big. And I got away from that. I had a point guard, Jared Smith, going to Michigan back my second year at Romulus. And it just made no sense. After the season, I, I, me and my assistant sat down like, what are we having Jared bring the ball up the floor and throw it to a kid that can't handle the ball, make plays? Like, what was the point of that? Like, let's keep the ball playmakers' hands. So we don't really run a secondary, but we do push it hard, and we want guys making plays. And we give them – we'll call them break options that we work on, you know, throw it ahead. And then what can the wing do once you get it ahead? Or, or you know, the wing may drive it, turn around, pitch it back to the point guard. Now, you know, we may have 12 different options we will rip through on some of that. But I don't want them thinking that they have to do – A, B, then C. I hate robotic, like even on some of that, but I don't want them thinking that they have to do 
A, B, then C. I hate robotic, like even continuity offense. I'm not big on that. Like I want when there is a whistle blown and the defense is set, we'll run quick hitters and then we teach them how to play. And when I say teach them how to play, like the play after the set is broken down is not that much different than our transition plays. Right. And we're going to get into some of your set type of philosophy in terms of, you know, what to do when a play breaks down, et cetera. But, you know, you mentioned the secondary break. And the other part about secondary break that I've found is that when you emphasize the secondary break, you usually take away your primary break because your players are focused so much on running the secondary that they're running, not running the primary. So I'm on board with basically everything you said there, which is, again, give your players some options. Now, when Golden State talks about, they talk about automatics. Are there automatics or are these concepts that they can all play to when you call break options you're basically saying you don't know what to have we yeah. talked about doing some autos but we really don't have any like if you throw to the two the one runs through like now we've got we call it through like point guard hits ahead runs through but it's that that would be more like because even our quick hitters are run fast you know and the whistle blows the ball's out we're still going to try to run through them fast so it's we don't really have any automatics we i've talked about it i had couple former assistants who one's head coach in the G League, one was at Iowa State, just left there a year ago, and they had some autos and automatics, and we talked. So I, we've talked about it. We don't really do those, though, and I'm not opposed to them. Next year, maybe I do them, but right now I'm not, I'm not as comfortable with those just because that hasn't really been the way I've done it. I would have to get more familiar with it myself, to be honest with you. No, and it's not right or wrong. It's just I just trying to give coaches a picture of what you do and why you do it. And the break options, I mean, that's, again, giving your players freedom, which I love. And just a picture of what you do and why you do it. And the break options, I mean, that's, again, giving your players freedom, which I love and part of my philosophy. So I guess coming back to that player development part of things, Coach, which is so important to you, how do you emphasize playing fast and that concept of tempo when you do your play development workouts? Does that show up in those workouts? Yeah, no, it definitely does. Uh, number one is we do a lot of stuff in transition. And, like, you know, we'll say skill work. Like, I'm not opposed to doing skill work with just a player making a move on a cone in the ball. But we do little of that compared to live stuff. And so when we get into live stuff, it's more some transition. We'll do, like, one-on-one with a trail defense. Like, basically, the guy with the ball starting at the free throw line, the first defender's at half court, the next defender's – at the baseline behind them and you got to go one-on-one, but you know, you've got a secondary defender coming. So there's not a whole lot of time to score, to score one-on-one. And then you come back two-on-one. So we build it up to where it's two-on-one coming back two on two. We do a lot. And we try to, if we don't do that, we call it our fast break progression kind of development stuff that if we don't do it every day, we'll at least do it probably two out of three. So we do, and we just come up with different ways and we play a lot of one-on-one from different, scenarios so like if I probably one of the things I get most upset with our guys about is we hit you the ball ahead and you have a one-on-one in transition and you don't go make a play like (laughs) I'm gonna be a little upset like what what's the point of doing all these drills like you can go like if you to me it's almost like I tell them it's almost selfish like because you you need to go make a play one-on-one to force the help so you can get your teammate a wide open, like, and we love kick out threes, get your teammate a wide open three. Like you not making the play doesn't help your teammates because now the, and all of a sudden the defense gets set against the set defense. Like every, it's much easier to just make the play right initially in the break. And, and then if we, let's say our two runs to the right, our three runs to the left. And really there's no difference between the two and the three really in our offense. But you typically now, once we get into the sets in the half court, there's a difference, but so if, if you're the two and we hit it ahead to you and you just don't want to be aggressive, well, it really just cost the three a, a wide open three, most right. likely. Because if you can beat the guy and then you force the other wing player to guard you in the lane and he gets a kick out, well, that's a wide open three. And people say a lot like our – even we had some freshmen and, they, you know, they're not comfortable standing in the corners. Well, our leading scorer was the guy that played the three most of the time and we brought the ball up the floor on the right side most of the time. And <laughs> C.J. Massenberg was – ready to shoot at all times on the left side of the floor. Like, but Wes Clark, you know, Wes is a point guard, but we really played Wes at the two 80% of the time because he was our best playmaker. So we hit it, we hit it ahead to him. 
he goes making play. Well, guess who gets to score a lot? CJ and Jeremy. Jeremy's our trail four. CJ's our three running to the left over there. So Wes will make a play. CJ and Jeremy get to play a lot of backside two on one together. And so those are our CJ was our leading scorer, and Jeremy Jeremy was right up there with him most games. So we get a little bit different philosophy. It's maybe a little less control by the coach during games, but you also got to drill it and drill it and drill it and work it and get your guys to play aggressive. And it helped that Wes had played for me for four years in high school and he had gone to college and it was definitely not the same. And he, he liked playing the way we play a whole lot better. So once we got him eligible, he knew exactly how we wanted to play. And he's pretty dang good at it too. No, very good. And, you know, it's always helpful to have a player that validates the style and the way you do things. So that's most helpful. And so many things you said there, coach. And one of them is obviously standing in the corner and to stand in the corner and make open threes. Like it's a simple concept, but it's not that easy to coach. Yeah, I agree because everybody wants to stop at the break. Like, listen, like first you got to explain to them they're shrinking the floor. We try to shrink the floor on defense, not offense. Like you want to <laughs> spread yeah. the floor out on offense, not shrink the floor. You know what? It's most hard. So we have a lot of junior college kids that we get. It's hardest with the guys that have had more coaches. Like, so a junior college kid that's maybe went to a division. Like I think of our kid, Willie Connor, who was at the MAC tournament MVP his first year with us, but he had gone to division one, you know, he went to high school. He's uh, he probably played for multiple coaches in high school and AU. Then he goes to division one. Then he did, doesn't work out well there. And then he goes to Juco. Then he comes back to me. So now over the last four or five years, he's played for a half dozen coaches and not to say that any of them did it right, wrong or whatever, but you know, first, like then he comes back to me. So now over the last four or five years, he's played for a half dozen coaches and not to say that any of them did it right, wrong or whatever, but you know, a lot of guys haven't taught. It took us an entire year to figure out. And I don't think he believed us at first, like just get (laughs) you cornered. You will get more shots in the corner than you will standing here on the wing because if you're in the corner, your man actually has to help off you on the drives. If you're standing on the wing, your man can just play both and you're still guarded. Like, so, yeah, I agree. Like, once they figure it out, though, and they realize that just trust the system, the ball will find you, you're going to get an awful lot of shot. And you're right. If you go – Danny Green's the current one. Go back to Bruce Bowen before him. Absolutely, yeah. Bruce Bowen. Yeah. Stayed in the corner, made corner threes, and was the best defender on the floor. He won himself a few rings and made a lot of money doing it. Yeah, no, it's great. And for coaches, I mean, I call this the two-side fast break. That's what I refer to in concept. If you draw help, the weak side corner is usually the spot that's left by the help. So that's the spot that's open. And emphasizing that has been really important for our program and our development and our ability to be able to play inside-outside, as you said, Coach. The other part that you mentioned is is a little bit of a non-traditional concept as well, which is moving your point guard to the head spot, which I love. I just love that because you're absolutely right. I think over the last few years, maybe in basketball, it's been so point guard dominant and so, you know, dribble push dominant that we've lost that hit ahead. And I remember when I first started coaching, the hit ahead was very popular, but it makes sense because why hit ahead to someone that can't make a play? So putting a point guard in those situations, or in your case, recruiting players that can make plays or developing players that can make plays is such a huge part of the game nowadays to be able to score in transition. No, I agree. And we kind of play with two point guards. So, you know, we had a more traditional, less like pass first guy, didn't score it as well. The kid Devontae, traditional, less like pass first guy, didn't score it as well. The kid Devontae Jordan, that kind of was the point guard. But then we put a, another point guard at what we call our two which was Wes, you know, so we're hitting it ahead to Wes. Now what we would do then once we got in the half court, we wanted Wes making most of the plays. So we would bring Wes off zippers and Iversons. And so the ball, the ball would find its way back to Wes's hand. And Wes, you know, you come off a zipper, then Wes is coming off the ball screen, making the ball screen reads and stuff in the half court. But then we did do some flipping with it based on who we were playing and how much we were going to be able to get in trouble. I mean, some teams, as fast as we play, will send – four guys back and we just you're just not gonna get that much transition. So let's move Devante the two, put Wes at the one. Now Wes has the ball in his hands, he's making a play. So we've played around with that a lot, but I, I like playing two point guards just because now they can't be two point guards that can't shoot. Like right. Yeah. Well at least one of them ideally they shoot, but at least one I can't play with 
I have to have at least three shooters, and I love to have five shooters. But if, if I don't have at least three, we can't play. And usually I have at least four out there. So whether it's the point guard or the five, one of them's got to be able to make shots. I can't play with a point guard that can't shoot, a wing that can't shoot, a big doesn't work anymore. No, and I agree. And, you know, and that's really, to be honest, how we should be developing youth basketball players anyways. And I always try and connect all these concepts back to that and saying, well, we want all of them to enjoy the game more. So we want them all to be more skilled. And I always say to kids when I coach them in camp situations or whatever, that I'm coaching you all and training you all to be point guards. Because wouldn't no, we I, want all of our players to be able to shoot, dribble, and pass? Yeah, no, I agree. Like, I mean, guess what? If I, You can play with five point guards. You can't play with five centers. Like, <laughs> Great point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could – so, shoot, if, I, if I've got three point guards that are really good, I guess what? I'll find a way to put you on the floor. Like, no, you got to be able to shoot, though. Like, I can't put – like, I can't – like, I can't put – three point guards that are dribbling passers like somebody's got to finish the play our guys got to the point they they know how we play like they get mad at their teammates for not taking the shot like we all know when the shot's supposed to be taken but like I just did all the work I collapsed the entire defense in the lane I kick it out to you well if you ain't get shot like I just wasted everything that I just did like so our guys get mad to shoot the ball they're yelling at <laughs> shoot the ball I just I collapsed three guys and found you a wide open shot or we throw it out. We got the backside two on one. We go one more to the corner. The guy doesn't shoot. Well, the guy that made the play to create the two on ones upset, the guy that threw you the ball in the two on ones upset because they all made the right play. Like you have to shoot the ball. So I'm sure you feel the same way coach. I mean, I noticed that when my players are yelling at each other for not shooting the ball, that they know our philosophy. Yeah. Like that they know what we're trying to do then. And that with our newcomers, I find that that's one of the hardest things is that they just come from such a, and I don't, again, not a criticism of other coaches, but they come from a pass first philosophy rather than a shoot first philosophy often because they're trying to run plays or they're trying to run continuities or they're trying to run secondaries rather than yeah. it's hard to get open shots. If you're open, shoot. Yeah, no, it's very true. I mean, so our guys get mad. I mean, it's, it's unselfish, really. Like, if I've got a teammate that I know is going to be mad at me when I don't take the shot, like, I better shoot it. Like, they'll also get mad at each other for taking bad shots because they know we can get a good shot. And they know how we're going to get a good shot every time. So why are we taking a forced one early? Just move it. We'll get you a great shot five seconds later. Like, and it right. may come right back to you in another five to seven seconds. So once your players figure out how you're playing that way and they can start coaching each other and teaching each other what a great shot is, it becomes a lot easier as a head coach. Well, it's great. I'm going to steal that. I love that a framing of the mind of a player to say that it's, it's unselfish to shoot an open shot because it absolutely is. I totally agree, agree with that. That's great. Great wording of that to sell players. Coach, how do you handle shot selection, defining shot selection for your players in terms of that philosophy that you have? Obviously, you're willing to shoot it quickly and you're willing to shoot open shots, but how do your players or you work through shot selection? Great point, because we had that discussion a little bit. Uh, we went to the Cayman Islands last year, played three games back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back days, and, you know, I, I kind of – we go through and chart every game, you know, contested versus uncontested, contested threes, contested mid-range twos, and I, I think we were seventh in the country, if I remember right. Some of these stats, I, you know, I get them out when we're recruiting. It's been a while since we had an official visit, but I think, I think we were seventh in the country at taking the least amount of long twos. And we actually had one of the best, in my opinion, two of the best long-range twos takers in our league in Jeremy Harris and Wes Clark. So those two shot a decent amount. We were still like seventh in the country in least amount of the taken. So our guys know I go through all the numbers with them too. Like you talk – 40% from two versus, you know, or shoot, 40% from three, you guys shoot 60% from two to equal that. So can you shoot 60% on this shot? Like, no, you can't. And to be honest with you, stepping two feet inside the arc, you're going to be more contested than you are staying outside the arc. So we go through all the numbers. I show them. We get early in the year, you have to talk to And again, you know, new guys are going to, fight you a little bit they're used to taking this and and to be honest with you some guys contested I mean if a guy's closing out on me the same as he's closing out on Jeremy Harris who's six seven and long and has a release up above his head like 
it may be contested for me and it may be uncontested for Jeremy. So, and that's what we had to t- kind of talk through. Like Jeremy also, we went through all the numbers down in the Cayman Islands. The next game, he's it's like, uh, I was getting more than a little irritated. I pull him out. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, well, I try not to take contested shots. So I had to, you know, in the middle of the game, it's not always the best time to explain. So then I just got mad. And then, no, you better start shooting all these shots. And then I had to explain after the game, like, listen, What's contested for somebody else, I said, if you feel like it's open, just shoot it. And, like, I'm going to start yanking you if you keep passing these shots up. So, I mean, we basically uncontested shot for us is if you're in range and you feel like you're open, like it's uncontested, like the guy may be closing out, but he may be closing out short. It's an open shot, take it. Like Right. Don't worry about the defender ultimately. Worry about your rhythm. Worry about if you're in your range, those different things. Yeah, I mean, what we get upset with is the guy that's trying to create his own and ends up with a long contested two off the dribble. That's the one that, and again, if I have to, like, get the rest of the team involved, you know, you may stop it. All right, who's team involved? Contested two off the dribble. That's the one that, and again, if I have to, like, get the rest of the team involved, you know, you may stop it. All right, who thought this was a great shot? Nobody raises their hand. Who thought we could have got a lot better shot that possession? Everybody raised their, okay, well, let's try not to. You know what I say? I said those are end of shot clock shots. If we have to take that under eight seconds on the shot clock, we know you can make it. You know, you don't want to mess with the kid's confidence. I know you can make that shot, Javon, but if we have to get it to you with under eight on the shot clock, then that's when we'll get it to you. You know, like, or even Wes. I mean, Wes can make a lot of those. Like, Wes, let's take that shot under eight on the shot clock. We can get a. I'm pretty confident we can get a lot better shot, you know, with 20 seconds left on the shot clock than the one we just took. That's great that you said that about asking your players the question because, well, I wrote a blog on shot selection and that was one of my main points is about developing that team accountability, which clearly you do with your player shot is for a certain player because it is player specific very much. And just asking the players the question empowers them to understand it better. So that's great. Coach, in-game charting. You talked about charting. Is it in-game? Do you do ro- rolling possession chart in-game? Is that what you're referring to? We do, yeah. So we um, – one assistant what, charts offense and one that charts defense. So – What's on the offensive chart? What type of things are on the offensive chart? That's a fluid chart. We started at the beginning of the year and then – so by the end of the year, we were charting, was it contested or uncontested, two or three? What type of shot we got? We were also charting – how many paint touches we got. So we started at the beginning of the year, how many passes. And I know the Warriors chart that. Yeah. I'm not as big on number of passes. I mean, who's to question what the Warriors are doing? They're winning. They're also ultra talented. But and I think they're doing a great job. Like, I love watching. Right, them. of course, yeah. But I'm not as big. Like, sometimes the number of passes, the more passes you got, the more likely you are to turn the ball over, too. So, like – it wasn't always directly correlated. Sometimes there was an inverse correlation with points per possession and number of passes. I think what was better was number of paint touches. So if you get the ball in the paint, you throw it ahead, the first guy that has it over half court gets a, a paint touch and kicks it out to the corner, like you better take the shot. So right. we got one paint touch. We got a wide open three. Very great possession. Like, I don't need to then pass up an open shot to get to five and six passes in the possession. So we started charting paint touches, and there was a pretty good correlation on at least one paint touch in our points per possession. Now, two paint touches typically went up, but sometimes it didn't. When you got to three, uh, again, the turnover rate gets really high when you're overdriving it as opposing touch. You kick it out to a backside two-on-one. You make one more pass to the open guy in the two-on-one, that's a great shot. Shoot the ball. Yeah, so we started charting possessions with a paint touch. I'm glad you said that because I know that's a popular thing getting shared around is the number of passes and certainly NBA teams. I do think that there's a value to the pass, so I'm not saying that, but I do think that what they're saying doesn't always translate to our levels, and it definitely doesn't translate to lower levels where you don't have as many talented players. And really, I mean, Golden State can create a shot anytime they want because of the talent on the floor. And if you have limited talent, you can't worry about number of passes. you got to worry about, hey, if we're open, that's a good shot for a good player. we got to take it. we got to take it. And And ball reversals can be overemphasized just like number of passes. 
No, I agree 100. percent Sometimes you're trying to get to the third and fourth side of the floor, and you turn the ball. Like <laughs> I would be. Or like, your late clock. Yes, and now you got to take a you got to take a contested one instead right. of an uncontested one. Like you know, a lot. Of, I don't say a lot, but some coaches are opposed to taking threes in transition. Okay, well that's that's great. Let me see the shot you got after you passed up the wide open three. Like, Thank you. Yeah. What's your, yeah. What's your points per possession on a wide open three? It is one of my frustrations in watching a lot of NCAA games, Coach, honestly, is that I do see some of the talent on the floor and how that talent sometimes is not allowed to take a shot early in a possession. And I understand maybe there's a balance with shooting it too much early in a possession, but just some of the talent, like some of the possessions there where it seems to be demanded to be a certain number of ball reversals before we can shoot. Yeah. I don't know if you watch football much, but like Chip Kelly was a pretty innovative, you know, yep, in here, yep. still, I think. Points or not points per possession. Time of possession, like he couldn't care less what his time. He would win games by 20 points, and the other team would have the ball four times as much as him. I'm a little bit the same. And I'm four times as much as him. I'm a little bit the same way. Like you go on time of possession on off. I don't care. Like just give me <laughs> like as long as my points per possession are higher than yours, and we have more possessions, we're gonna win. So, like, if you want to take 25 seconds to take a contested shot and I take five seconds to get an uncontested one, like, I'm good with that. Yeah, well, and I agree. And I'm – yeah, sometimes – and that's where you can get in trouble when you look too much at some of the numbers and certainly where you can still follow historical and cultural norms about how we used to coach the game as well, which emphasize certain things that I think as – I know as players are more skilled nowadays that we have to find ways to take advantage of that as opposed to having one or two players that can make plays. You often have a lineup where you have four or five players that can make plays, and that yeah, makes I, it a lot easier. No, ideally, my five can make threes. You know, when we play Nick sure. first, five a lot. Like, yeah. So either my five can make threes, or I want it like Clint Capella type. Like we had a kid, David Kadiri, who forces the help on and I don't. We're not in the ball screen offense and defense, but if he can sprint to the rim off a ball screen and he can throw the thing up, then they can't guard the ball screen with two guys and that you force the third guy in, now you're playing closeout basketball. And really, we tell our guys, I really have one goal on offense, to force one hard closeout that they can't guard. After that, it's over. Like, if you can – so you run a pick and roll, you hit the shake man coming up there, you have to close back out hard because they had to help on the roll man. Our guys know if they're closing hard and you can rip it and go by them, now we're playing driving kick basketball, and we are guaranteed to get an open shot once we get you into driving kick basketball. So we need one – close out that they can guard and then it's over after that that's really our goal in the half court that's great that's a great great goal and a great framing of it for your players to understand and it relates back to the drills that you talked about with some of your individual workouts or some of your team drills which is that one-on-one -on -one with the trick yeah no i'm not big on like shot fake jab steps all this other like give me a break with that stuff like <laughs> all that does is let the uh, defense get back in front of everybody so if they're closing on you you either shoot, drive, or an immediate one more because it's a two-on-one. -on -one, the one's closing on you and the other guy's over. That's it. Like, those are your only three options. Like, there's no shot fake jab step. Like, let the defense reset. Like, yeah. That'll get you pulled out faster than, than a contested shot. <laughs> I think coaches that are listening that know me a little bit know why we get along so well based on the things you're saying. Cause we definitely see the game similarly in that sense. And, Coach, I'm curious because when you just said that, and I want to come back to, so hopefully I'll remember to come back to what you chart on the defensive in-game possession chart. But when you say if someone jabs or someone shot fakes, it gives time for your defense to load up. You're a pack team. You guys pack a little bit on defense. Is that mentality of how you use the possession chart? But when you say if someone jabs or someone shot fakes, it gives time for your defense to load up. You're a pack team. You guys pack a little bit on defense. Is that mentality of how you see offense and what hurts teams when they play a certain style of offense? Has that influenced your defense, yeah, how you want to play defense? On offense, I would love the floor to be spread so that we, there's big driving gaps so we can get in, collapse the backside, kick it out and play. Like We like to play drive and kick basketball. That's, I feel that's how guys want to play. They, they don't want to be robots. They – you know, so on the defensive side of it, how are you going to keep teams from driving on you all day? Load up to the ball, put a guy in each gap, don't let them get in the lane, make them keep the ball outside. And you know what? And some guys offensively like to 
pass the ball around the, the you know, and they're like more of a passing game. And if we know that going in, we'll we'll cheat the gaps up a little bit and we'll apply more pressure. And we've got to deliver the ball to player X coming off this screen or this action. The coach is going to go off on him if he tries to get out of the offense and go make his own play. So, you know what? In that regard, we've got certain calls. Let's go make him try to make a play. We'll give him a big gap because he doesn't have that option. The coach isn't going to let him make that play. So, against certain teams. Yeah, we call dead in that situation where we just say we're dead, we're denying off the ball, or we're not helping because we know that it's a one-on-one matchup that where we have an advantage. Yeah, so we'll – I mean, we'll tweak it for – different scenarios and different teams and different players and but generally our base defense we're definitely packing it because I think the hardest thing to guard in my opinion is a guy coming at me with a full head of steam one-on-one with space on both sides I can't guard I mean even back when I played and the game wasn't really that way that's that's hard to guard especially with the way they call it now you can't put your hands on them one-on-one with space on both sides I can't guard I mean even back when I played and the game wasn't really that way, that's that's hard to guard, especially with the way they call it now. You can't put your hands on them. Right. It's, I mean, in college, I mean, you put a hand on a guy. To, so we're going to come at you with a full head of steam. And now if they're going to come at us like that, we can't leave that guy one-on-one because he can't. I feel like we've got the best on-ball defenders in the league and Carruthers and Jordan. And even then, we still want to pack it in and make those gaps really tight on those those guys. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, it's great to hear that. Like, if, even if you're an offensive coach or a defensive coach, it doesn't matter. You're a basketball coach. But sometimes one end of the ball in your philosophy influences how you approach the other side of the ball because you know what works on one side, and you're saying, how will I counter that on the other side? Yeah, and one of those that came up this year, and it, I think it's big right now, is like switching ball screens. So, like, you know, and, I, and we've got discussions amongst the staff, but one of the things that comes up, Keep the ball moving. Forget the fact that they're switching. Just run, do what we do. Keep it moving. Okay, which I'm a little in between. I want to make them pay for certain switches. So we'll, but I agree, you got to keep the ball moving. I don't want to get stale while we're making them pay. So we, we've got different, that's a whole other topic we could talk about another day. But then you flip that. So let's say you're an offensive coach. Okay, so why wouldn't we switch? Right. On defense? So if, if, T, if we're not going to do anything different to attack it, what are we so worried about the switch for then? Like, just switch. If they can't figure out how to attack the switch, switch it. I mean, to me, ball screen defense, if you can guard a ball screen with only two guys instead of forcing the third guy in and and making – the easiest way to guard a ball screen with two guys is to switch it. No question. And if they're not going to make you pay, then just switch it. I mean, you saw it in the NBA Finals. (laughs) There's a lot of isolation basketball or even the conference finals. There's a lot of isolation basketball because they switch the ball screens – and then they're just and then they're just trying to go at certain matchups. Well, and it yeah. always crazy. we've been switching for a long time, and I think the FIBA game has dictated that for us a little bit, just because there's more ball screens. I think earlier, you know, than you would normally see maybe in the longer shot clock game. But yeah. we've just said switch and let's try and force them to figure it out. And as you said, generally we've always switched the up down. We call it switch the up down. I think the NBA term now is scram. But we've oh. always switched you up down because those teams that keep the ball moving, we can just switch back matchups anyways because they give right. you that opportunity. And it's been very successful for us. And I just posted an edit on the basketball emergence site of us doing that from a few years ago, which we call switch you up down. So it's such a, and I, I'll be curious now because everyone's watched it through the NBA playoffs, how much it influences, you know, coaches going into this season. And you would just, I think if you're a coach that's trying to stay ahead of the game, you better figure out what you're, Offensive philosophy is against the switch. Definitely. Because definitely. I, philosophy is against the coach is going into this season. And you would just, I think if you're a coach that's trying to stay ahead of the game, you better figure out what your offensive philosophy is against the switch. Definitely. Because definitely. I firmly believe you're going to see a lot more switches now. Yeah, and we'll get into that another day. But the other concept is, which I've stole from the NBA, is the boomerang concept, which is like just yeah, a quick it. pass back and then you can attack with space and. You know, that's kind of a marry the two topics a little bit. Yeah, well, and that goes right into the concept. Like I said, what's the hardest thing to guard? A guy coming at you with a full head of steam with big gaps Space. on the side. So yeah. if you're going to switch, you better shrink that floor really tight, especially if you're going to switch 5-1. Like yeah. you can't switch and then get out and deny. Like, or you can. I just think the ball's going to be in the lane all night on you. Yeah, and for coaches that know the term dead 
and the term early, which is what you're just talking about there, is that in a bad matchup situation, we would be immediately calling early. We're not a pack team, but we'd be immediately packing in the world, in my opinion. And uh, he's been using those concepts for a while. And it just gives an easy understanding for your players to know, again, how we're handling those matchups. In whether we're it's a good matchup or a bad matchup and that's great stuff coach and I'm, I'm really glad we're getting into some of these topics some of this stuff let's go back to defensive chart then since you shared the offensive chart I know coaches would be tweeting me going what's his defensive chart in game yeah so in game on defense I mean we're trying to keep the ball out of lane just like on offense we're trying to get it in the lane so we went to like paint touches same thing we have a problem we play really aggressive I mean sometimes People, I think, misconstrue the concept of pack teams like passive and not aggressive. We try to get ultra aggressive on the ball. And so in my opinion, like now you can get really aggressive on the ball and deny and just try to disrupt everything. And there's some really good coaches that do that and it makes it really hard. But like I feel like with the way the game's called, if you're really aggressive on the ball and you want to be aggressive on the ball and you want to keep it out of the lane, you kind of got to pack off the ball and give that help. So that, that's kind of our philosophy. So we'll chart basically paint touches and then same thing. Now fouls, we had a problem with fouling. That's where I was getting to. We wanted to stop fouling. We didn't do a very good job of it. We still fouled all the time. And I think some of that goes with, I would rather be more aggressive and get a mindset that we're, it goes with our offensive mindset too. We play fast. We're aggressive on offense. We're coming at you. Well, on defense, I don't want to be passive, but I also don't want to open the floor up. So yeah. we chart, I mean, we, chart who's fouling on just really dumb fouls, to be honest with you. Like, there's some fouls that are dumb and there's some that aren't. But other than paint touches, it is really, was it a contested shot or not uncontested? So we want them to take contested twos. Like, I think Michigan was number one in the country in forcing their opponents to shoot the most contested long twos. One of my former assistants at Romulus, Sadi Washington, is the, the assistant that's been with Beeline the longest there in Michigan. I, I talked to him, like, February, like, try, I want to get out there and have a sit down with, like, we want teams taking long twos. We don't want to take long twos. So we chart how many of those. And then the last thing, the, the most simple thing, the thing back to high school, like, just chart whether it's a stop or not. If you foul, it's not a stop. So we're trying to get three stops in a row. We're trying to string as many stops together as we can and offensive numbers. Some of that may be based on personnel. We recruit offensive players and try to hammer the defensive side of it home to them. And I think Tony Bennett recruits defensive players and <laughs> tries to turn them into pretty good offensive players. But he's done a really good job of it. We're a little bit the other way. And I think my guess would be more people in college recruit offensive players. But – and we, re, we want a certain type too. We want long athletic on the wings and guys that can make plays. Like one through four has got to be able to make plays. So then – We'll play those guys. We just – then we make them play defense. So, our defensive side maybe not quite as as much with the charting. It's, it's The biggest thing is we're, when we come at every four-minute timeout, we're going to tell you how we got scored on and really like – and then let's talk about what we got to do to fix it. So, you're going to tell your players just what you mean every four-minute yeah, timeout? Every, yeah, and, and The I, main you, things that are hurting you. Yeah. Yeah, when I was Bobby's assistant for two years, I charted our defensive side. So, while Bobby – Went back the last through over the last four minutes. Like, look, we, we they they scored this, that, and this. We got to shore this up. We got to do better with this. We got whether it's an offensive rebound, whatever it is. Do you tell your players the same thing on offense? Do you give them a, a summary every four minutes, or is offense you don't want to get in their heads as much, and you just want to give them freedom to play? We will if we're not getting the ball in the paint enough. Like, we, look, we had eight possessions. We have two paint touches. That's bad. That's yeah. really bad. So. Or if we're not playing fast enough either, like we, we had eight possessions. But part of that is our defense. I mean, we could talk about offense, defense. To me, they, they go a lot more hand-in-hand hand than what some people want to say. Like if we're not getting stops, it's hard to get out and transition on offense. Right. So, or if we're fouling all the time, well, then there's whistles all the time and the flow's not nearly as good. And we're, we play a lot better in flow than we do when there's a ton of whistles. Well, that's great. I'm glad you brought that up about the every four minutes to tell your players what, you know, how you're getting scored on. Because really the whole point in asking that question and that time and the flow is not nearly as good. And we're, we play a lot better in flow than we do when there's a ton of whistles. Well, that's great. I'm glad you brought that up about the every four minutes to tell your players what, you know, how you're getting scored on. Because really the whole point in asking that question, and that's my mistake, is to find out what practically you do share with your players. Because it's one thing, you can chart anything you want, but it's is it your information or is it players' information? And 
I've always been a big believer sharing it with players or it's not useful to players in some way. Well, however you share it. No, I agree. I and mean, we do a lot more charting after the games than during the games. During the games, if you can't give it to the players, then what's the point of having it during the game? Like, Right. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree 100%. No, that's great. One other thing it came back to a little bit is this concept of fouls. And you said that you foul a lot. I don't know. Sure, I'm not sure if that's on the ball or off the ball, but regardless, do you find that when you foul a lot, you get away with a lot off the ball? But regardless, do you find that when you foul a lot, you get away with a lot? Like that's kind of been a little bit of the philosophy that I'm like, okay, like we don't call fouls in practice. We don't worry about fouls because if we're fouling a lot, we're finding we're getting away with fouls. Is that true or is that uh, a little true. off base? So look, I, uh, every year me and my assistant back at Rhymus would go to a, either an NBA training camp or a college for an extended period of time, whether it was three days, five days. So one, one of the ones we did when uh, Vance Walbury, I don't know if you know Vance. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so when he got the job, I had known Vance when he was at uh, Fresno City, he gets the job at um, Pepperdine. So we went out. We had never been out there. We had just talked on the phone, traded, I think maybe met at clinics or whatever. But I had like six of his DVDs from games when he was at Fresno, and he scored like 180. And <laughs> so we had studied some of that. So we we go out to uh, – out to Pepperdine for five days, me and Josh do. My assistant, it's all tight for both teams, right? We got more depth. <laughs> yeah. If they're not calling it, that's great. We're following you in the press and we're they're doing all this. So, like, he had a way of spinning it, like, which, and we're going to get away with it. Like, they're not going to keep calling it all the time. So, I 100% agree with you. Like, they're not going, like, we got to play West Virginia. We, <laughs> second game of the year, we're at West yeah. Virginia next year. So, guess what? If you want us to call these fouls in practice, well, they ain't going to call them all when we're at West Virginia. No, they're going to get away with way more for sure. Yeah, and we played West Virginia in the NCAA tournament the first year we went, you know, with Bobby's second year four years ago. So we, you're, they're just not going to call them. That's just like the refs just aren't going to, like, they may try to establish their control early in the game. Well, that, whatever. That's part of the reason, too, that we, a whole other topic, but we, Nick Perkins was our big man. I feel like bigs always get screwed on calls. Oh, yeah, like, of course. The guard can do it and the big can do it. They're calling on the big right away. Well, especially at the high school level. Bigs get punished for being bigs. The guard can do it. A whole other topic. But we, Nick Perkins was our big man. I feel like bigs always get screwed on calls. Oh, yeah, like, of course. The guard can, can do it. They're calling on the big right away. Well, especially at the high school level. Bigs get punished for being bigs. Because usually you yeah. can put a small guy. And actually, that's a defensive strategy coaches should consider. Because I've seen it a lot at our level work. Where a really good big is having a great game. And we just decide to put a 6-2 guard on him and just tell him to foul him as much as possible. And for whatever reasons, referees let the little guy get away with so much on the big guy. And it's a psychology. It's taking advantage of the psychology, right or wrong, but it works. No, but it's true. Yeah, there's that. And so with the big, we started a kind of smart who wasn't as skilled offensively. Perkins. I think we were the only team in the country that had four guys that averaged 15 points or more, and Nick Perkins was one of them. But he propensity to get in foul trouble. So we brought him off the bench. I mean, he's like one of the best six men in the country. Well, while the referees are establishing their, the way the game's going to be played, if somebody's going to get a couple fouls, well, I'd rather have Nick watching the referees establish their control of the game, and he's not picking up the fouls. Appreciative, and I encourage coaches. I mean, you need to learn more about Coach Oates. Tremendous and refreshing and honest in your sharing and your approach and if you haven't listened to the Coaching You Live podcast with Brendan Sir, I think that's wonderful for coaches to listen to as well. Because I know you talked more about that experience of the NCAA tournament and the Arizona game. And I know it was covered so well there. I don't want to get into it too much. Although we might come back to it at some point personally and talk some more about it. But coach, I mean, amazing. Great to have you on. And I hope to have you on again sometime. And I know in person at some point, we hope to connect and talk more about the game. And, you know, that'll happen at some point. So thank you. No, I appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for having me on. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballmersion.com. That concludes today's clinic and consulting needs at basketballmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there 
and share the game. You're jumping back into the gap. All right, to coach. It's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. 